Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our first live video for the Meet the Scientist video series. Um, this is a monthly series that we will host as we interview different scientists from both ECU and our um, partner institutions. Usually, Dean Reed Corbett will be doing the interviewing, but due to unforeseen circumstances, he wasn't able to make it tonight. So I will be filling in as the host. Uh, my name is Parker Kellum, and I am the Outreach Specialist here at the Coastal Studies Institute on the ECU Outer Banks campus. And joining me tonight, we have doc Dr. April Blakesley. She is an Assistant Professor with the ECU Department of Biology and was the 2019 ICP Coastal Fellow. So we'll go ahead and get started. April, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, Thea, thank you so much for inviting me to, to do this interview. It's really, it'll be really nice talking to you about a lot of the things that I've been doing over the past many years. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm right now in the biology department at ECU. Um, my main areas of research are conservation, um, marine ecology, parasitology, and I kind of weave all of those things together to, um, to think about like some of these like ecological and evolutionary questions that are important. Um, one of the things, if, if we want, I can show you my academic trajectory um, sure. and give a little bit of background on that. That sounds great. Um, so I actually started out in, um, in New England. So I went to Boston University for my bachelor's degree, and that's where I started really getting into marine science. So I was part of BU has a marine program, which was really interesting. I got to spend actually a, a semester um, in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, which is one of these places that everybody thinks about for marine science. Um, and so during that time, I got, um, I got to do some actual like hands-on projects, and that really got my interest in some of these like ecological studies that I've been doing over the past um, many years, one of which um, I, I've continued to work with this species ever since I first started. Um, and then I did a master's um, at, at BU as well. That was a completely different uh, kind of project. So I actually worked um, with birds um, at that time. So I worked with an oven bird, the oven bird species, which is a neotropical migrant species. And I was really interested. That was a conservation. So uh, it, it relates to a lot of my conservation um, interests. But we were interested in um, site fidelity of this particular bird species. So I did my master's uh, thesis there. Um, and then I went on to do a PhD in marine ecology at the University of New Hampshire. Um, that's where I really started working with um, invasive species. So that's going to be a lot of what I'm going to be talking about um, today um, in this interview. So my project involved um, trying to resolve a really long-term question about um, the ecological history of a species on the coast of, um, of North America. And so I used a lot of tools, including parasites, to help in understanding that. Um, after that, I, did, I went to the Smithsonian, so that was a really cool place to do a postdoc. Um, I continued my interest in marine invasions there, um, and I worked with some more uh, species, invasive species, um, and did uh, quite a bit of work uh, also using parasites, but also genetics to try to understand some of these invasive species. Um, then I got a first job as an assistant professor at Long Island University. Um, it's LIU Post Campus. So that's uh, on Long Island. Uh, it's about a little bit um, east of Queens. Um, for that job, that position, I continued to do a lot of research on marine invasions, um, taught a lot of um, uh, classes on ecology and marine science. Um, I really enjoyed the position there, but there it was a lot more teaching, So, and I'm very interested in research. So ECU is great because it has a nice balance between um, both teaching and research. And so um, since 2015, I've been in the biology department at ECU. Great. That sounds like an awesome path to get here. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're really glad to have you in North Carolina. Thank you. So for the question of the night, we're going to be talking about zombie crabs. What exactly are they, and what does it mean to be a body snatcher? Um, yeah, so if we have, I have some, I think some uh, images here. So this is actually um, a mud crab. This is a native species. Um, you can find it throughout North America um, in the Gulf of Mexico, all the way up the coastline of North America. Um, and what we're seeing here is um, the 
the crab is like up on its, basically you're seeing the abdomen um, upwards, so it's on its back. Um, and we have actually these two little features down at the bottom on its abdomen are actually parasites. Um, and this is actually a parasitic barnacle. Um, most of the times when we think about barnacles, we think of the, you know, the white um, things that are, that are on like piers and on docks and on rocks. Um, but this is a barnacle that has specialized to be able to infect these mud crabs. So it's a really interesting um, and fascinating evolutionary um, uh, design that this parasite has. Um, and this is actually showing, you can see two of these um, these are the reproductive, actually, organs of the parasite. So this poor crab is actually infected by two different parasitic barnacles here. Um, see, so we can see that some, most of the time we just see one, but occasionally we see, um, you know, several, uh, several different parasites. So of course, that's a very unfortunate crab. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so if we, I think if we move on, there's going to be, oh, this is looking at the life cycle. So life cycle, um, it looks complicated, but it's actually fairly simple because there's only one host that's mm -hmm. involved here. Some parasites use multiple hosts to complete their life cycle, but this one has just a single host, which is the mud crab. Um, but it looks complicated because there's two different pathways. So the first pathway, if we look at the kind of the bottom one, that's actually um, the female pathway. So the female is actually um, what infects the crab, so the female barnacle. So we know it's a barnacle based on the morphology of the larvae. So you can see the couple of pictures like the nauplii and the cyprid. So they go through um, uh, these morphological changes, but once they find, and this is when they're in the water column as larvae, once they find their crab host, they go through even more changes and actually essentially inject themselves into the circulatory system of the crab and spread throughout the inside of the crab. So this is referred to this body snatching um, type of parasite. So it takes over on the inside, and um, in, in a little bit I'll show you, we'll actually be able to see what it looks like from an artist's rendition, but it's a whole bunch of roots that are spread out through the inside of the crab. Um, on the other pathway, so that's, that's now the crab is infected by the female barnacle. and. Um, a lot of uh, changes happen to the, to the crab. It actually castrates, which means it completely eliminates reproduction um, of that particular crab. So that crab can no longer reproduce its own babies. Instead, it's essentially forced to reproduce the babies of the parasite. And so the parasite produces this, um, if you see number four, it's a virgin externa. So these, this now um, contains unfertilized eggs of the female barnacle. So then the other pathway is the male pathway. So the male and, you know, essentially job is to, pro is to provide sperm um, for those eggs. And so the male will actually um, uh, get into that larval sac and then uh, provide sperm and then you'll have fertilized eggs. Um, and at that point then the parasite larvae can, um, can then get into the water column and the whole cycle continues. And that's what we see here is the mature externa. Now you have fertilized eggs. And so that's what, if you look at the diagram that we looked at before, and it's up to the, the right here, you can see that larval sac. That's a fertilized sac full of the, the babies of the parasite. Wow. And this is, again, what it looks like on the, this is a really famous um, artist rendition um, from 1904, as you can see here, that all of those little, what look like roots, that is the parasite on the inside of the crab. So it spreads out throughout the entire body um, of the crab. It gets into its nerve center. It changes behavior. Um, it also, um, both male and female crabs can get infected. So both male and female crabs will have that brood sac of the, of the parasite. And the male will start actually showing maternal behaviors that males would never show um, if they you know, weren't infected. So it changes the behavior. They call that um, male feminization. So the parasite essentially is, uh, is helping itself by having both male and female crabs care for it, care for the brood sac as if it were their own um, including males, which would never do that. Wow. Um, so essentially, uh, this is why they're called zombie crabs. Um, that's because during that process, it's castrating, as I mentioned, it's castrating the host. Um, so this is referred to, this parasite is called a parasitic castrator. So the host is reproductively dead, and so that's why it's called a zombie crab. So essentially, now this crab is at, you know, at the mercy of the parasite, um, help, essentially helping the parasite reproduce its young instead of being able to, to reproduce um, its own young. Um, and so the interesting thing about this, so that's kind of the overview, and there's many different types of these, they're called rhizocephalan parasites, these parasitic barnacles. Um, you can find them all over the world, but the ones we're focusing on here are in North America. 
Um, and this is just showing you a graphic of um, what's going on here in North America. So in the Gulf of Mexico, as you can see down kind of at the bottom of the screen there, um, you have both the parasite and the host um, are co-evolved. So they're both native to that region and have been together for many, many years, like thousands and thousands of years together. Um, but before, as you can see, this graphic showing the 1950s to the 1960s, the parasite was not found along the coast of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, the host was there, but the parasite was absent. But probably, we believe it was through the trans uh, transport of oysters from the Gulf of Mexico to the Chesapeake Bay, and that was when um, uh, populations like stocks of oysters had started to decline in Ches the Chesapeake Bay. This was to try to revive some of those stocks. And we know that oysters are great habitat for all sorts of organisms, including mud crabs uh, live and that pretty, pretty much love to live in these oysters. So probably some infected um, crabs were moved through these shipments, and now the parasite is on the Atlantic Ocean. And because the, the parasite knows, how, knows really well how to infect this host, right, because they're together in the Gulf of Mexico, um, so the parasite is really good at infecting um, these mud crab hosts, but the host in the Atlantic coast was completely naive to the parasite before it showed up. And so we see a lot of infection prevalence. And so that's what this figure is showing you. So in the Gulf of Mexico, again, you can see that's in blue here. Um, this is where the parasite is native, so both host and parasite are native together. You can see you get less than 10% infection in those mud crabs. So it's showing you that there's clearly you know, some kind of resistance going on by the host. Um, but when we look on the Atlantic coast where the host had been naive, you can get up to 91% of the crabs that are parasitized. So it's really impactful um, to the host in this particular region. And again, it's because the host um, prior to about the you know, mid part of the 1900s had never experienced this parasite before. Interesting. <laughs> well, before we go to the next question, I just want to remind everybody in the audience, if you all have any questions as Dr. Blakesley is talking, please feel free to use the chat box and we will answer those questions at the end. Um, moving on to the next question, um, where have your study sites been and what has been the biggest factor to influence parasite presence? Yeah. So, um, so if we have, I think there's going to be a figure coming up um, showing some of our study sites. So this is again looking at uh, the uh, North America and mostly the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic. So I was, as we were just looking at where we have the parasite that is native. We also have a region where the parasite is introduced and this ranges in time from about the 1960s when it showed up in the Chesapeake um, Bay to it also then started spreading southward. So we have it all the way down to Florida now. There's also a random population in Long Island. Um, when I was in Long Island, we actually studied that there, and that was really interesting. It, it probably, that was probably through shipping, so shipping moving from the Chesapeake Bay up into Long Island Sound. Um, the parasite showed up there. But the rest of the region, um, kind of north of Chesapeake Bay, uh, the parasite is absent. And so the interesting thing about that is now we have different um, coevolutionary histories um, in these different regions. And so that would, that's a really interesting aspect of this, um, this whole system is that we can look and ask questions about um, parasite susceptibility and other types of things, um, parasite prevalence, like crab abundance population effects, community effects, and all of these different locations because the parasite um, is so impactful on its host. So that's overall. The, the other thing that's really interesting about this um, is that salinity plays a role as well. And so this figure looks a little bit complicated, but it's actually pretty easy to understand. So essentially what I mostly want to point out here is that um, dark black line, that is looking at the prevalence of the parasite. Um, and then our dotted line, or like with the bigger dots, that is salinity. And so hopefully you can tell that they essentially track each other. Mm -hmm. So when you have higher salinity, and this, oh, sorry, I should back up and say this was a, from a, a long-term um, data set in the Chesapeake Bay that was run by the Smithsonian Institution. It's um, some data that we're currently working up and are writing up right now. Um, so LOXO is our parasite. Um, and then our host are these mud crabs. And again, you can see that they're tracking with salinity. And so this led us to believe that salinity is playing a role in whether these crabs are getting infected or not. Great. So if we, 
move on. <laughs> um, sorry. So this led us to um, some questions uh, that we wanted to pose and thinking about this now that we know that it seems like salinity plays a role. We wanted to actually test this more um, explicitly. And um, in just a second, I'll, I'll show you in North Carolina how we're doing this. But essentially, um, what you can see here is that salinity is likely playing a role because the parasite just has a, a more narrow tolerance to salinity, especially in very low salinities. Um, than does its crab host. And so in these moderate to high salinities, the parasite can survive. Um, and in particular, it's the larvae. So the larvae just can't survive in really low salinities. Um, so this leads us to question whether the host could potentially have a refuge from infection in these really low salinity sites. So that was one of our questions. We also were wondering about from the evolutionary side, so obviously parasites are a strong evolutionary pressure and salinity is a strong evolutionary pressure. And we're wondering if there could be trade-offs because moving into low salinity waters um, could, be, could be stressful to the crab. Um, and that's because they have an optimal salinity range. They can live, you know, in these lower salinities, but, you know, their preferences are more in the kind of moderate salinities. And that's, that's what they, where, where they do best, or that's the, um, the hypothesis is that they're going to do best in these more moderate salinities. So there could be a trade-off between get, being free from parasites, but then also having this added salinity stress. So that's, those are the questions what we're posing. Um, and North Carolina is a really great place to test this because we have this really extensive estuary system here. And the rivers are really nice because you can establish sites along a salinity gradient. Um, and then that's essentially what we did. Um, we set up all of these different surveys along a salinity gradient, gradient in these two estuaries. So we have the Pamlico estuary um, along the Tar Pamlico River. Um, and we have a very low salinity site, which is around zero. That's in um, Washington, North Carolina. Essentially, it's, it's actually at um, the estuarium, which, is, which I'll come back to talking about in a little bit, um, kind of one of our important sites. And we go all the way to Swan Quarter. And that uh, gets up to about 12 parts per thousand. That's how salinity is typically measured in parts per thousand. Um, and then we have the new estuary, as you can see, going from about New Bern all the way up to Cedar Island. So we have a nice range in salinities to be able to test the questions about um, how the parasite is going to be influenced by salinity and how the host is going to be influenced by the parasite, which is influenced by salinity. Awesome. Well, that sounds good. We're excited to hear what those findings continue to be. Yeah, so we um, actually set up this in 2016. In the summer of 2016, we deployed what, what we call crab condos. Um, I did not come up with this name. I think it's a great name, um, of actually, the Smithsonian. Um, they've been working on this for a long period of time. They actually came up with this. And we call them condos because they're not traps, as you can see um, from the picture in the upper left. Um, that's a like a milk crate, which people used to like put CDs and things in, which typically aren't really used that much anymore. Actually, it's hard to find them these days. Um, so we have like a stockpile of them just in case. <laughs> um, but we fill these with uh, oyster shell, sterilized oyster shell, and put them out um, in the at these different sites. Either attach them to docks, or we use like wooden stakes, like stake them out into the the benthos. Um, and they attract the crabs because the crabs really prefer this oyster habitat. Um, so it's a really good way to recruit these mud crabs. So you can see just some, a few images of when we deployed um, in 2016. And I think we might have, oh, now we have a video. So this is actually showing um, today, we actually went out and I have some of these, um, these crab condos out at uh, the waterfront here at CSI. So we went out and took a little video. So this is me pulling out the, the condo. You can see the oyster shell in there. So then we go through and pick out the mud crabs. We keep all the mud crabs, and we, um, we um, measure them for their size. We look at their sex. We see if they're parasitized or not. Um, we get counts of them as well. So here you can see this is a parasitized one. So they're really tiny. That's the other thing. It's a little bit hard to tell um, based on the, the images we've seen so far. But mud crab, these mud crabs are really small. Um, uh, a small species, but you can see that parasite can kind of take over um, a, a pretty large proportion of its abdomen, so you can definitely tell when it's mm -hmm. infected. Um, and this is just showing some of the results of our data so far. So we've um, analyzed um, from 2016 to 2019 in both of these uh, two rivers, and essentially this is just to show that we did establish a salinity gradient, so again, we wanted to test our questions with changes in salinity. Um, and what, we're, what I'm showing here are the different sites in the Noose estuary on the left and the Pamlico estuary on the right. 
and then their average salinity. So North Carolina, <laughs> that's one of the things that was very interesting to me when I came here is that the salinity changes so dramatically here, um, you know, from, from month to month, mm -hmm. which I wasn't used to. Um, but on average, we can see that we've established the salinity gradient at each of these sites. Um, and this, is, this affects the parasite prevalence. So I think that might be yep, the next slide, which you can see here. Um, so essentially what we're showing, again, are these different sites broken up by the Noose Estuary and the Pamlico Estuary, um, and then the prevalence of infection. So the prevalence of infection is the number of crabs um, that were infected out of all the crabs that we sampled. And so you can see in our really low salinity sites in both the Noose and the Pamlico that there are um, essentially no parasites present. So we don't start to see parasites showing up until we get to about 9 or 10 parts per thousand. Um, and this is uh, corroborated by some of that lab data that was done earlier on that showed that the parasite larvae just can't survive in these lower salinity waters. So we've been able to establish that, um, that there are these differences based on salinity for the parasite. We've also, this is actually a, look, a regression looking at the prevalence of infection and the host abundance. That was also something we were wondering if we would see some effect because, because this parasite is a castrator, you might expect um, it could have an influence on the population size of the, or the um, number of individuals that you might have in a population because if they can't reproduce, then you're not gonna have as many crabs um, or if they're reproducing less, you're not gonna have as many crabs. Sure. And we do seem to see some evidence of that. So as prevalence goes up, you can see that overall um, in these really high prevalence sites, we have lower host abundance. It's a little bit of a weak signal because there's a lot of things that are influencing host abundance, but we do seem to see some signal of prevalence on this. And it, it especially seems to be the case in the Pamlico. The noose, the signal is a little bit weaker, um, but in the Pamlico, we see a bit of a stronger um, uh, signal it's an, and it's also significant, so it's statistically significant. Um, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> well, okay, so based on all of these findings that you've just described, do you think that there could be implications for other species that are found within the same ecosystems? Yeah, for sure. So these mud crabs are actually um, intermediate um, in food webs. So they're really important. So um, this is just showing, again, the, the oysters that they like to live in. So there's a lot of organisms that live in these oysters um, with the crabs. Uh, they can be prey for the crabs and they can also be predators. So we have quite a few predators that are in this system um, that like to eat um, mud crabs. Um, and we also have um, prey as well, so tiny little invertebrates. And so because these crabs are intermediate in these food webs, if you have effects on the population, you would expect that to kind of ramify through the community. So you could start to see community impacts. And there have been some studies that have suggested that when you have really high prevalent infection prevalence, you do have changes in some of the community members just because they are such an important component of those communities. Wow. And how about we've been hearing um, more and more about climate change mm -hmm. over the past several years. Do you think that that could have any possible effects on host parasite relationships? Yeah, for sure, and, and in particular in this system, um, we already have some evidence of that. So I had mentioned earlier that in Long Island, we actually um, saw the parasite um, has this kind of disjunct uh, distribution. Um, oh, and this is just show, showing the effect of, you know, obviously um, the, the temperature, potential temperature rise, rising that we're seeing like on our planet, but also um, in our oceans. And we believe actually that this is one of the, um, reasons why we saw the parasite show up in Long Island. So it just so happened to be, uh, in 2012 when it was first noted, it just so happened to be an especially really warm year. There was a warm winter and warm summer. And this parasite is from the Gulf of Mexico, right? So it's adapted to warmer right. temperatures. So it doesn't typically do very well in like, especially in winter, like cooler winter temperatures. Um, but because we are starting to see changes in temperatures, we're getting warmer winters, um, we're seeing um, warmer summers and winters, we're starting to see range shifts of species like moving northwards. And so we think that probably this is, this is what happened here. So not only with human movements um, through, boat, through shipping, but also because 
the conditions were favorable for the parasite to be able to invade, we actually saw it show up in Long Island Sound. And obviously that region is a very um, prominent port for a lot of shipping. And so we could continue to see the parasite show up there or potentially other locations into the future. Um, the other thing too related to salinity is that we're seeing, uh, seeing sea level rise and so you're getting a lot more saltwater intrusion into mm -hmm. areas and into our estuary so we might start to see the parasite moving into areas that before it wouldn't be able to get to be just because the salinities would have been too low. Hmm. Earlier you mentioned um, about how the parasite had traveled with oysters or through shipping so I'm wondering is there anything that the public can do to um, inhibit unnatural movement of these parasites? Yeah, so just, just generally um, invasive species, the best way to deal with them is to prevent them from you know, getting there to begin with because once they become established, it can be really hard to get rid of them. So a lot of people know about lionfish. So it's like probably one of the poster child for, uh, for invasive species right now. Mm -hmm. And that um, particular species is now so abundant um, in the Atlantic waters, in the Caribbean, in the Gulf of Mexico. It's like moved all through all these different regions. Um, and it's very difficult to get rid of it now that it's there. And so there's a lot of ways that you know, people can try to prevent um, the movement of invasive species, um, including parasites. It can be both free living species and parasites. So these are just some of the ways like, the, so boating and fishing, obviously boats we know are really prominent for moving species around because they can, organisms can attach to you know, the sides of your boat or in larger boats we have like ballast water. And so mm -hmm. a lot of species get moved through ballast water so this is why they're all often saying, you know, please clean your boats before you go from one waterway to another because you might be spreading like, for example, like invasive plants or invasive algae or even just other organisms that are attaching, you know, even animals can attach the sides of boats. Um, and it says here drain all water as well because, because of the fact that you might have um, like especially larvae that can get into those and then you can move larvae from one place to another. Um, also bait, so bait is a really unfortunately prominent way of species moving and it's, it's often people don't think about this because the bait is usually packed in like algae and algae is also a really great habitat for a lot of organisms. And so you might get um, some bloodworms, for example, in a cooler, in a bag filled with algae and the algae, a lot of times people will just discard the algae wherever they are thinking that, okay, it's, you know, it's just algae, it belongs in the ocean. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, there's often a lot of organisms that are a part of that. And so um, that has been the mechanism of moving several species as well as through, through uh, bait. Um, and then you saw like the boot there as well. So washing your boots because little things can attach to your, to your boots, even like tiny organisms that you can't see. Right. So mm -hmm. all of these are good ways to try to prevent species from spreading because again, once they get there, it can be hard to deal with them. Awesome, that's good advice. I'm glad to hear yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for our last formal question of the night, um, could you tell us about how your work can relate to that of other scientists, whether that's directly in your field or something that could be applied elsewhere? Yeah, definitely. So I think we have a, a graphic showing um, the, this. So this is actually a word cloud. Um, of the papers that I've written related to um, many different topics. And you can see like some of the prominent things that we've talked about like invasion, marine, parasites like showing and crab showing up there. But a lot of the things that are in here as well like management, um, uh, genetics, uh, like structure, community, there's just so many, um, so many components and invasion science in particular is really interdisciplinary because it relates to, there's also social sciences. There's so many things that come together um, in trying to understand and prevent um, invasions. And so interdisciplinary work I think is incredibly important. Important. Obviously we can't be experts on everything. And so working with other people and collaborating with peeper, people that have different expertise, we can you know, get a much better understanding of these questions. And so, yeah, so the interdisciplinary disciplinary nature of science is really important for us to be able to answer any kind of question. Sure. All right, well, now we'll open it up to questions from the public. I have two questions right away. What came from the mud crab, and is there any sort of implication to predators feeding on zombie crabs? So the first question was, what feeds on mud crabs, and then are there any implications 
for predators that feed on the zombie crabs? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the things that typically feed on mud crabs are other mud crabs. <laughs> crabs are like uh, notorious uh, cannibals. They eat each <laughs> other. Um, or other species of crabs, like blue crabs, um, stone crabs that we have out there. Um, you could have like fish as well. Um, some of the mud crabs are really small, so it'd be really easy for a fish to just eat whole. Um, so lots of different, um, especially smaller organisms that are associated with uh, oysters or in the, the benthos. Um, that the other, that's a great question about what happens uh, if a predator eats the zombie crab. So essentially, the, both the parasite and the crab die at that point. So the parasite cannot be transmitted um, from the zombie crab to another host. Um, so there's just a single host. So if that host dies, then the, the parasite dies. But it's a great question because there are many parasites that actually use that um, connection between predator to prey to be able to move from one host to the next host. And so there's a lot of parasites that have evolved that strategy to be able to move from one host to the other. Um, and sometimes they actually change the behavior of that first host so that it's more likely that the next host will eat them. So that's a great question. But at least for the zombie crabs, nothing happens to the predator. They just get extra nutrition from the parasite. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so what we've question. seen, sorry? Repeat the question. Repeat the question. Oh, will uh, salinity, so will climate change affect salinity in the future and this will this be good or bad news for the crabs? I think, is that right? Okay. Yes. Um, so yes, yeah, so as I, as I previously mentioned, um, with climate change, we're seeing the um, sea level rise and we're seeing um, actually these saltier waters moving into estuaries. And because of that, the parasite um, will have more access to more parts of the estuary than it will than it would have before. Um, this, you know, we've we've seen it seems to be you know, kind of incremental, but this you could over time start to see um, more populations of the crab that are potentially getting um, impacted by the parasite because the parasite now can live in these different regions. So that's one potential. So it could actually be um, if that happens, then that would be more detrimental to the crab. Um, but the crab is mobile, so it's possible that as salinities are changing, it could also continue to move upstream. And so if it can evolve this really low salinity tolerance, it might be able to stay ahead um, of the parasite as you see kind of shifts um, as it's moving further up into the estuary. Neat. Yeah. Another question. How does someone Do you have any advice for students that may be interested in your type of work or science in general um, that you could share with the audience? Yeah, definitely. Um, so one thing is if students are interested, they could find like volunteer opportunities to, you know, you really start to learn about a system once you actually work in it. And so um, uh, finding those volunteer opportunities can be a really great way of of getting, you know, sort of getting your foot in the door and, and figuring out if this is really interesting to you to begin with. Um, the other thing too is um, in, um, for students that end up going to college and you know, maybe pursuing biology, you can often um, work in, in labs or either volunteer or get um, credit to work in, um, in a professor's lab or a faculty member's lab. And so you can get a lot of, um, a lot of experience that way. And again, it helps you learn whether this is interesting to you, but it also gives you experience so that you can continue kind of moving up the ranks. Um, so I would, I would definitely suggest pursuing those kind of opportunities. For me too, like that, what was really instrumental to me was when I did the marine program, the um, Boston, University, Boston University's marine program, because we were actually able to do, as, one, as part of our coursework, hands-on research. And so the first time I ever studied some of these organisms was when I was an undergraduate student, and that really solidified my interest um, in this. Um, it does take to get to, to kind of finally the faculty level, it does take a lot of schooling. So I've been in school, I was in school for a very long time. And in some ways I still, I'm still in an academic institution. So it's kind of like I never really left school, I guess. Um, but for me, I really like that. I love working in, in an academic institution. I love 
learning new things. I love being able to do this kind of research. So it requires a lot of um, schooling, but in the end, you can end up doing some really cool things. So, so to me, I, I, I guess I've really enjoyed that, um, but it does, it does take a bit of work. But I would say for sure, um, volunteering and, um, and trying to just, if experiences arise, like just try to go for them. Awesome. Yeah. That sounds like some great advice. It looks like we have one more question. The question is, what are the implications for oyster reefs that um, have a presence of the parasitized mud crabs? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the oyster reefs are being utilized by these mud crabs as habitat. Um, and so the, the host, for sure, um, requires those oyster reefs in order to be able to survive. Um, and so it's interesting to think about what would be kind of the oyster effect um, from if you have declines in population of the of the crab because of the parasite like how does that influence the oysters themselves and that's not something that that I know um, has been too there's been too much research on that I mean oysters themselves are parasitized and so there's a lot of similar implications for disease dynamics between the oysters um, and this particular system. Um, so we can at least like learn a lot from both, both of these different systems and be able to figure out more about disease dynamics and understanding how salinity plays a role and that kind of thing. Because the oysters also have an impact from salinity um, for their diseases. Um, but that's a really great question and something that would be neat to pursue is what, what happens to the, the oyster reefs like if you have these population declines. Um, in the in the mud crab host, I'm guessing you you kind of have movement in of other because you know, there's there's always going to be competition in these um, oyster reefs, so you might have movement in of other species if you have declines of these mud crabs potentially. Mm. But that would be really interesting to look at. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we don't have any more audience questions. I have one more question okay. for my own curiosity to wrap up. What have you got going on next? Do you have anything exciting coming up? What's in the plans for you? Yeah, I think we, so today actually we went out to the shoreline. Um, this is at Oregon Inlet at the Pea Island Life Saving um, Station. So there's another species, I, I studied a lot of invasions, and so we have another species that I'm looking for here. Um, this is the, called the Asian shore crab. It's also, as I just mentioned, invasive, comes from Asia. Um, this particular species has been around for the last couple of decades um, and has become one of the most abundant crabs that we see in rocky um, zones. Here it's actually its southernmost distribution. It, unlike the parasite that we talked about um, that likes warmer temperatures, the, this crab likes cooler, huh. so it's kind of a cooler temperate species. So you find it really prominently up in, um, up in like New England and um, when I was in Long Island it was really common there as well. Um, so we're really interested in seeing some of the parasites that we can find in all of its different populations along the East Coast and then also uh, influences on reproduction as well. So I was um, out there today trying to collect some of these crabs. Uh, there's not that many as, as we saw, there weren't a, a ton of them there. And again, that's probably because it's at its southernmost distribution. If you go up to New England and you flip a rock over, you'll, they'll pour out like cockroaches. So <laughs> they're just so abundant. So yeah, so that's some of the work, continuing to work on invasive species and many kind of different systems out in this area. Awesome, that's really cool that the research you did in the very beginning is some of yeah, the research that you're continuing back. now. Yeah. It's like a full circle. Yeah, full circle, yeah. <laughs> that's so awesome. Yeah, you never get away <laughs> from these uh, systems. They always come back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and um, for being our first guest on this new Meet the Scientist series. We really appreciate it. Um, and audience, thank you guys for tuning in. We hope that you will join us again next month. And finally, thank you to our IT team <laughs> that helped make this all possible. We hope you guys all have a great night, and we'll see you next month. Okay. Great. Bye. Thank you.